True Tales Live on PPM TV is made possible through the generous support of Artists Collaborative Theatre of New England, Act One, presenting outstanding performances of Stories with Heart at the West End Studio Theatre in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. For further information, contact 603 300 2986 or on the web at act1nh.org. With additional support from Pat Spaulding, who really wants to know, hey, what's your story? I can't believe I'm 92, and, but I am. And uh, my father said to me, but he says, said, when you're building your life, the most important things are the four L's. And the first L is listening. And that's what we do when we come to, to, to Jonesboro. We listen. We listen. And it's a rare thing these days, listening. Listening to the human voice. Listening to one person talking to another person. Listening. We have forgotten how to listen. How to sit down and talk and have a good time listening. My daddy said, listen, God gave you two ears and one mouth, and he expected you to use them in that proportion, which is a, you know, a good listen. The first L is listening, and the next L is learning. You have to learn something different all your life. Don't ever quit learning, but listening and learning and laughing. It's the third L, he said. We've all got to laugh. Laugh at ourselves. Laugh at something every day. The world is a magical, wonderful place, he says. But we need to laugh together. Don't laugh at people, my father said. You laugh with people. And you can never hate anyone you've really laughed with. Laughter binds people together. The most important L is loving. Loving. That God put us here to love each other, to enjoy each other, to help each other, to laugh together, to learn together, to listen together, but to love each other. And there's nothing that says I love you more pleasantly and more plainly than storytelling. Everybody here has stories that you need to tell, need to tell to somebody you love. And now is the time to do it. Go home and tell stories and tell each one with love, ending with, I love you. Thanks to Catherine Tucker Windham, speaking at the 2010 Alabama Storytelling Festival at the age of 92 about the importance of stories. Some of us know that almost by heart. Last year, when we, last uh, time when we couldn't hear it through this, the mic, we pretty much just enacted it. So we love, <laughs> we love Catherine. Uh, I'm Amy Antonucci, here to welcome you to True Tales Live, coming to you from Portsmouth Public Media TV, Channel 98, here in New Hampshire. We're really happy to be back after our summer break. And it was quite a summer, and now it is not summer out there. It's <laughs> incredibly different, and we are really, uh, really grateful for those watching and listening, and especially for those who did come through the deluge out there to be here in our audience. So thanks for coming. Our mission at True Tales Live is to provide a space for people to tell their first person experience stories, stories that reflect our community's personal and cultural diversity, and help us bridge differences and build understanding and respect. We definitely encourage the development of storytelling skills. We have workshops and give some personal help to those of you who, who want it. Um, but this is not a competition. We'll have tonight not have ranking or scoring or judging. We're really here because we believe that stories shared from the heart 
uplift and inspire us, and um, we and bind us together, and we want us all to be a part of that. So that's why we're here. The theme for tonight's show is bridges, crossings, and connection. Like I just said, we feel that one great way for people to connect is through story. But we're going to have five stories tonight. On that theme, we'll, we'll hear what those folks thought of when we said bridges and connections and crossings. It's always fun to hear how each person took it to heart, whatever our theme was. We're going to hear from five tellers. We have Nancy Lukens, Aaron DeBacco, Mike Cohen, Audrey Mason, and Tina Charpentier. They'll each have 10 minutes for their storytelling. And Pat Spaulding, our MC, will introduce each of them to you before they step up. After the storytelling, there will be an interview that David Frainer will do of Audrey. So stay around for that. But first, for the stories. Let's welcome Pat to introduce our first teller. Come on, Pat. Hey there, everyone. It's really good to see us all here again after summer break. It is now fall. Yay, coolness. <laughs> oh, not so much yay, rain, but no. it comes with part of the package. First up tonight, we have Nancy Lukens, originally from Vienna, Virginia, has made her home in Dover, New Hampshire since 1985. She is the parent of a 29-year-old daughter and is married to a German-Canadian. In 2009, Nancy retired as professor of German and women's studies emerita at UNH. Fluent in both German and English, she has authored, edited, and translated several books in both languages. The focus of her teaching, research, and activism expanded significantly during her stays in East and West Berlin in the 1970s and 80s, years when Germany was still divided. Her story is titled, <coughs> Silences. Come on up, Nancy. Thank you. So I'm going to bring you back to summer. <laughs> <laughs> Silences. <clears throat> Children, roll down your windows and listen. I heard our dad whisper as he slowed to a stop on the rickety wooden bridge over Bull Run. It was one of those blistering, humid August nights in Virginia when a drive in the countryside after supper could offer a, a little relief before, before bedtime. No AC or window fans back then. So when dad had called mom, my big brother and me, to come get in the car, I probably pictured a little trip to Dairy Queen, but you never know with dad, the nature lover, camp counselor, urban youth leader, parish preacher, who loved to pass along valuable lessons. So there we were on that old bridge in our scorching 1947 Plymouth, grunting and sweating, cranking our windows down. I was seven, my brother was 10. He got his window down first. Okay, Dad, sitting in the car on a bridge to listen, really? I don't hear any radio. Mom gives him a look. Dad looks out the window. Silence. But then I start noticing sounds coming from everywhere, rushing water echoing as the little brook courses through the narrow channel before opening onto the famous Civil War battlefield. A bright blue bird fluttering, flapping her wings, jumping on a rock after her cool bath, then hopping up onto a shady branch. Birds of every size and color, cheeping and chattering, and then taking off out of sight. A chorus of crickets, singing, then silence. Suddenly, a loud rustling nearby. Wind? Dad signal silence, as a great horned owl landed on a hedge just ahead stared right, af right at us, and then gave that long, haunting cry I'd heard once at camp, then flew off. I wasn't scared of owls anymore, and it was cool as we drove home in silence. Those early lessons in listening were buried, but not forgotten. 
Fast forward to 1962. I'm 17, an exchange student in Graz, Austria. My host family consists of Mutti, Fati, Inge, and their maid, Frida. Two sons had been drafted into the Nazi army and sent to the Eastern Front, where they were killed. The family home that had stood on the site where we were then, in a nice apartment, had been destroyed by American bombs just months before my host sister Inge and I were both born, right before the end of the war. One day, Inge had come running in from school, yelling, Mutti, Fati, we can host an American sister. We just need to fill out this form. Can we bitte, bitte, bitte? Of course, I wasn't there to witness that moment. <laughs> were they still grieving their personal losses and their political defeat and unable to even hear Inge's, who really wanted a companion? Could they even wrap their minds around bringing an American into their barely rebuilt home? I have to assume that the Austrian returnees that had just spent a year abroad and had come back really enthusiastic about what they'd been doing, and they were there to recruit the Miltles as a host family, they must have said something. About the founders of the American Field Service, AFS, they were World War I ambulance drivers, and they had created AFS to bring young people from former enemy nations together to prevent the kind of ignorance and hatred that had caused so much loss and destruction in two world wars. One indication that the AFS spirit had caught on was that Inge had organized a club called Club Gutwill. So there I am in October 62 on my first evening with Mutti, Fati, and Inge, sipping my first glass of wine ever. Mm -hmm. Inge. Oh, Nancy, can you dance to Charleston? We have dance hours every Tuesday. Mutti. Nancy, tell me, you're confirmed, you're 17, but you've never had a glass of wine? <laughs> Fati. Listen. Saturday, we're driving to the Brenda Pass across the Alps. My company built it after the war. More plans, outings, visits, skiing at the mountain hut over New Year's. I'm clueless, wondering how I'll survive four months listening to all this German. I've never had German. Inge sees my face and asks sweetly, you understand everything? Yeah? Not something you ask of beginning language student. <laughs> Instead of saying, nine, I repeat the word I did not understand, selbstverständlich, as if to ask, what is that word supposed to mean? They crack up. To the question whether I understood everything, I had replied, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> they explain, I get it, and soon we're playing a word game. A tiny part of me is starting to like it. They hear my ami accent, ra 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 ra. I need to learn how to roll my R's. They're reciting the ditty that that Vienna opera singers use to get that. So we're having fun. <laughs> Listening and laughter had built a bridge of trust. A little more wide, and I'm already quite dizzy. Fatih asks, "What about your town? Do many Jews live there?" In retrospect, I find it hard to believe that I had no idea what he was asking. Mm. I knew the word Jews in English from scripture, my dad's a minister, Jesus was one, but I thought if Juden means Jews, that's a really weird way to ask about my hometown. Mm. I'm appalled that I had never studied World War II much less German, before being sent to a German-speaking country that was still just recovering from, world, from the war. World War II was the last chapter in our textbooks. We never got to it. Mm -hmm. The 1977 TV film Holocaust wasn't even thought of yet. The concept of genocide was, was not commonly mentioned at that time. My friend Rachel's dad taught us Israeli folk songs, but their name, and their name was Gottlieb, but I didn't know that was a Jewish name. So in retrospect, I'm ashamed that I knew nothing of Judaism or the Jewish experience, experience or what had gone on in Europe shortly before Inge and I were born. 
So when Fatih asked, how many Jews live in my hometown, I asked, was heißt Juden? What does Juden mean? Silence. I kept, lis I kept listening. No answer. Silence. Dessert was served. The subject never came up again during my stay or for many years after. This experience taught me to listen more deeply and longer, far beyond the level of learning a language, although that became more and more fun, to listen for the silences. Studying German literature and culture, I read and heard a lot of stories of those who grew up imbibing the rhetoric and ideology of racism and extreme nationalism. Some were victims, some were bystanders, some were children and grandchildren of those. Some were perpetrators. Some were, uh, they were confronted in the 60s by their, their children especially, my peers, about why they hadn't done something, why they had participated or become complicit in their own country's crimes. Some risked their lives to stop Hitler. Many of those were imprisoned and killed for doing so. That wartime generation, whether Nazis or bystanders or resistors, and their 60s children, my peers, have taken generations to begin to deal in one way or another, whatever their experience had been, with trauma that they had experienced, but kept silent about and moved on. <laughs> Fast forward to 1977, I'm on sabbatical in Germany, studying anti-Nazi resistance. I'm living in a small religious community of men and women on a farm in, uh, near the East German border. Family and friends of a member of the, East German, of the German resistance, Adam von Trott, founded the community after Trott and other conspirators were hanged by the Nazis for their efforts to overthrow the regime. To, to restore the rule of law and build a peaceful Europe. I'm living on this farm, given free room and board in exchange for helping out wherever I could in the community. So one day, Brother Peter comes and knocks on my door. Professor Nancy, we need you up on the mountain. Hop in the car. On the way up, he explains that up at the summit, by the memorial to the resistance, there's an American tank from the Fulda armor base and a truck full of G GIs. One more minute. <laughs> They're about to begin a military exercise. Peter had tried to tell the commander that the little park up there by the cross is des designated as a memorial, so they should pause and respect it and do the maneuver elsewhere. I feel ashamed that my countrymen are trespassing on my German host's sacred ground. We were up facing the tank now, behind it, a huge truck. Peter's sheepish that his English isn't good enough, so he has brought someone to tell them the story in English. I'm kneeling on the grass looking up at this huge tank and wondering how I can make this clear. They're mostly African-American, young guys, and I'm telling them about these young people in their prime who died to prepare Germany for a post-war Europe. What does this mean to them? So I say, now these people are finally being honored instead of being called tra traitors by their own people. So you see the cross up on the hill there, it says to Adam von Trott and his friends who died in the struggle against those who would destroy their country. One of the young G GIs looks over to his buddies and then back to me and says, hey, you know, that sounds like, kind of like Martin Luther King. I look at, him, look at all of them and say, you know, I'm a teacher and you just made my day because you get it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, you never know when those connections are going to come. Next up we have Erin DeBacco. She lives in Deerfield, New Hampshire. For three decades, she has led workshops in community and educational settings to address racism, privilege, intergroup relations, and conflict through dialogue and education. <coughs> she manages the Active Bystander <coughs> Program for the Granite State Organizing Project, 
as well as having worked with programs such as the National Coalition Building Institute, <coughs> Everyday Democracy, and New Hampshire Listens. Her story tonight is titled, Insiders Know, But Outsiders See. Erin? Racism teaches me that my story is the center of everything. Beyond the necessary self-centered of toddlerhood and the self-absorbed drama of high school, another layer is sustained into adulthood, which tries to tell me that I get to be what normal is and that I get to belong just about wherever I am. It does this by telling me and others that they are not the center of their own story, that they do not define the standards of success, and they do not completely belong, even when in their own homes doing perfectly normal things. Looking back over my life, I see that the lie of this story, that I am the center of everything, peeked out all along the way, including through my parents' sympathetic conversations about the civil rights movement and the high school friendship that fell apart when I was surprised at the lack of white faces in her family photographs. I was unsettled by my reaction, but instead of looking at what was inside me, I labeled it discomfort and left. Though I did not know the history into which I was born or the meaning of later events, I got wind of them when four girls were killed in a church, when King was murdered, when students wore, rode buses for voting rights, and when SNCC told white organizers, including some of our family friends, that they'd have to leave that organization to do their own work someplace else. My point in this brief and incomplete review is that the issues of racism were already roiling the waters when I stepped into the river. And though I could not know it at the time, these factors have shaped how I came to move through the waters. Though I had been prepared by my experiences, the first time I felt my normalcy as a lie and set about learning a truer story happened half a lifetime ago in a world where I was distinctly not the norm. It happened because I accepted an invitation to cross a bridge of friendship into a different world, even if only momentarily, and let myself be changed by what happened there. The event, which served as the fulcrum, the pivot point in the story of my racial awareness, began when I traveled to Jamaica with a group of friends. One of my fellow travelers went there regularly and was friends with a man who lived on the island named Horace. Horace became part of our group, helping with arrangements and showing us around. He and I spent time talking the first few days of my trip, me stumbling over my challenges with what I thought of as his accent, and as, and as we compared notes about how we each understood the worlds that we were part of and where they overlapped. Then Horace took us all to a beach near his home. To get there, we loaded up in two boats. I'm sure there are names which would evoke for you the long, low, motorized crafts from which I could trail my hand in the water as we ran through the sea. But I don't have those words. I can only tell you that we climbed into them from the resort's beach, and then we rode around an island whose geography was not part of my internal maps internal maps, and we ended up on the black sanded beach near Horace's home, and there we had a lovely day. And then it was at the end of the day and time to go back, and we returned to the boats. And as people were climbing in, Horace asked if I wanted to stay and see his home. In that moment on which the rest of my life pivoted, I plunged to the unknown and said, yes and then watched as everyone on the island who I knew well rode away from a place I didn't know the name of to a place I could not have found on a map. After they were out of sight, I stood on the beach with Horace and watched a man wearing a machete stride toward us and hoped that the voice that had told me to stay had, in fact, been intuition. Horace's home was up the hill in the jungle that met the sea. The building was made of branches and thatch for which I did not and do not know the proper words. The lighting was kerosene, the cook fire some fuel that made me queasy, and I remember cassava root being in all the meals they shared with me. They were Horace and his friends. We sat up late that night, 
Mostly with them talking and me trying to track the, track the conversation through a version of English I did not know well. At first, I was aware of being the other there, by culture, class, race, and gender. But the others didn't seem to care. So I sat with them. And as I sat there, not talking much, taking in what I could of their stories and letting the rest go by, my awareness of our differences began to fade. In the morning, Horace and I headed back to the resort. First, we walked on well-worn paths through the trees to a dirt track which brought us to a small cluster of brightly colored homes where we got into a taxi with four or five other people to get to a town where we disembarked to wait for a bus back to everyone I knew well. It was mid-afternoon. The town square bustled with kids in uniforms headed home from school, vendors who were selling vegetables, clothing, pots and pans from carts and storefronts, people going from where they, needed to, from where they were to where they needed to be. I was in a bit of an altered state. I was overwhelmed from being in so many settings so fast, settings I was not familiar with, the queasiness from the cook fire, and the lack of sleep from sitting up late into the night. So I was just hanging out waiting for the next thing to happen when a little orange sedan drove into the traffic circle, stopped for a moment, and sat there while a few tourists leaned out of their windows to take pictures and then drive away again. This happened so quickly that I was, became aware of my reactions only as they were pulling away. My first reaction was anger at those white people for treating the people and place as something to be claimed and consumed. Though I'm not sure how much of that was my emotion and how much I was picking the ripple as it passed through the crowd. My second reaction was the startled realization that in many critical ways, I had more in common with the people in that car than the people around me. It occurred to me then that besides the people in the car, I was the only white person I had seen since the boats pulled away from Horace's beach. And I noticed that for a day or two, I'd forgotten I was white. It turns out I've been unable to forget ever since. I titled this story Insiders Know and Outsiders See because I wanted to capture that moment that gift of dual consciousness in which I first saw myself as white through the eyes of people who were not. When I first understood myself as the carrier of a problem that I did not want to be part of. I didn't know at the time how much it would change me. I was angry and startled and then the bus came and we went back to the resort and after a few more days I returned to the States. I didn't know until I got back that in that moment in the square I had lost something. I had lost the ability to turn off noticing racism. In one moment for which I had spent a lifetime preparing, the shell that protected me from really seeing racism shattered, and I was naked in the face of it. Everywhere I looked, I saw and felt the physical, emotional, and intellectual impacts of racism in a much deeper way than I ever had before. Even though I was not its target, this consciousness wiped me out. It was weeks before I could build the filters back up. To not, not to not know or see, but to take it in at a more manageable rate. At that moment in the square, it became impossible for me to ignore racism or to accept it without resistance. I have not always been graceful, aware, or smart in this resistance. Like most, maybe all, white people, I've been quite bad at it sometimes. Decentering my own whiteness is an ongoing process, but I could have not have made whatever progress I have made without the people who were willing to offer me bridges into what they knew themselves as insiders of other racial identities. I have also grown in my understanding because people inside other racial identities have been willing to share with me what they see about me that I cannot. This is a more risk-filled bridge for them to cross over than any I have ever gone over. In sharing with me what they see about me, they risk triggering my defensiveness and possible resulting attack from the power position of my whiteness. Even if they have the tools to deflect it, they still need to decide if they want to bother. And sometimes they don't know how bad the risk will be before they make that decision. Most of my growth, my learning, my progress 
has come from people who are willing to take this risk with me. In the decades since I decided not to get on that boat, I have come to understand that some of the barriers to communicating insider awareness may be insurmountable, and that people in targeted groups have no choice but to notice what outsiders think they see about their group. But the learning which has taken me deepest into my, which has taken me deepest, is the dual consciousness about my own racial identity, a consciousness that first awoke the day I sent the boats away and set about learning what outsiders know about me. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Next up, we've got Mike Cohen. He lives in Woburn, Massachusetts as a web developer, most recently for sustainablemarblehead.org and a devoted member of the Gang of Six, a core group of story enthusiasts who keep the story space going. Uh, story space was founded by Brother Blue, and now it's in its 26th year. It's a weekly storytelling program in Somerville, Massachusetts. Mike is a former board member of Lane's, currently called Northeast Storytelling Network. He has biked solo from Seattle to Boston three times, has told stories on both radio and television, and has recently concluded that he looks a lot better on radio. <laughs> <laughs> he said that himself, as do we all. The title of his story is Rainbow. Come on up, Mike. <clears throat> We're getting there. There we go. Voila. <laughs> mm. There's a line in a lesser known Mick Jagger song. Weren't you down in San Antone on a hot and dusty night? Well, I was, because at the tender age of 24, I ran away from home and joined the Air Force. It was a bitter cold February when I got to San Antonio to go to basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. The prevailing temperature was 80, maybe 70 at night. And I came in late to my flight. A flight is about 50 young people who are being trained in what looked like a high school locker room. And apparently the previous day, the people that had come in had been told they had five minutes to go in the shower and get rid of all those god beards and mustaches. And apparently it was a bit of a massacre and there were still splashes of blood on the sinks and the floor. <laughs> we were rainbows because for four days or so, we still had our multi, our literally motley clothing and our hair, most of which was long, some of it was afros, some of it was what we now call jufros, you know, some of it was flat topped afros and just scraggly and short and whatever. And they marched us around in this flight, four files, four rows of about 12 or 13 people. And they just marched us everywhere like we were a wagon or a bus. And the drill sergeants were just pure slabs of meanness. They could have been three feet tall, three and a half feet with the Smokey the Bear hat, but they had this magical ability to be not only in your face, but looking down on you. They were not allowed to swear. They could maybe say Galdern, but they just had this way of making you feel really small. Now stop acting like such a Galdern robot and get information, hero. Or hey, slick, when's the flood coming through? If you had high water pants, which always somehow seemed to happen. And they would just march us from place to place for four days. And we would just, they would park us somewhere 
and go inside and who knows what they were doing. Smoking, filling out paperwork, getting a cup of coffee, laughing hysterically at how terrible we were, holding their heads and crying because we were so terrible. And one day as we were just standing there like a truck that had been parked outside a cafe, a flight of people who had been there longer and had their pickle suits, their khaki, their khakis on, was marched and parked there and the sergeant went inside and as soon as he disappeared, we heard razzle dazzle left step harch. And then this flight of four rows unpacked itself as they moved apart stepping precisely and then they started doing left faces and right faces and they were twirling around it was sort of like a combination of fireworks and a halftime show at a southern football game <laughs> <laughs> and we were dumbstruck we later found out this was monkey drill this was called monkey drill the sergeants were always saying whatever you do don't do any monkey drill of course this was a masterpiece of reverse psychology because again like the sergeants, these people in their pickle suits had made us feel small and made us know we were just rainbows. And if you'll pardon the expression, we were lower than whale poop on the evolutionary scale. <laughs> you gotta think about it. <laughs> you gotta think about that. After four days, they took us to a uniform warehouse where we were handed our own pickle suits and boots and underwear and they barked orders at us and we were just terrified. We'd been terrified for four days straight or four or five days straight and we were just more terrified so this process could have been more efficient but we were just terrified. And then we left and we got to go, I think we actually put on our put on our new suits and our boots there and we carried our offensive rainbow garments with us away and after that we marched more proudly and then somewhere in there they took us to the barber and we handed the barber 90 cents and they took out these huge clippers and, and in as many seconds our hair was gone we were as bald as cue balls and we marched with no hair but we had pickle suits and eventually we got little we got the little name tags and tapes and the little white and blue insignia and everything. And then we were no longer rainbows. And I had a work detail where I had to go to that same uniform warehouse and help hand out clothing. And I got to see from the other side these poor terrified rainbows being barked at and confused and in a state of total fright. And on the way walking back from that Work, work detail, I had to stop in and use the restroom and I'm standing at a urinal when a drill sergeant marches his flight up and parks in there and comes in and he was seven feet tall without the Smokey the Bear hat. He was three and a half feet wide at the shoulders. He was like a triangle on legs. He basically wearing, he was wearing a Captain Midnight shirt which was this discontinued dark blue shirt that had special rules, you had to starch it so it had creases right through the middle of the pockets. It was really sharp looking. And this guy comes in, stands next to me, and then he says, well, you wanted to go, so go. And I think he's talking to me, and I'm like, back to the terror. And then I realize he's talking to his unit. And by his unit, I do not mean the people that were outside on the curb. <laughs> He is talking to his own urinary tract. So I got out there, out of there very quietly and quickly. And then we got to meet, we got to meet our sister flight, which was a flight of female recruits. They had been given uniforms and then marched to the BX, the base exchange, and given a $50 clothing allowance to buy their own underwear. Some logistical genius in the Air Force had figured out that there was no way that the Air Force could stock all the different possible kinds of underwear in the different sizes and shapes that women might want or need. So they just gave them some money and let them buy their own. 
I also learned another thing. If you look good without hair, you will look even better with hair. <laughs> this, unfortunately, is not a reversible reaction. <laughs> and then, and then, since this was now March, and there were people coming down from the north, and it was basically 10,000 young people, male and female, coming from the north, a lot of people had colds and the flu. And it was essentially, as, one, as somebody said to me, we have a 10,000 person epidemic. We have 10,000 cases of the flu marching around here. And they just dosed us with antihistamines. And I would be marching along singing that Mick Jagger song and sort of come to and see this endless concrete plane we were marching along and go, whoa, whoa, in formation. Whoa, whoa, this is really happening. And then the clouds would roll in again. And it wasn't all marching and work details. It was a lot of classrooms where they taught us the history and traditions of the Air Force and many other things. And one of, the, one of them was a class in which we were studying diversity. And I came to this line about ethnic groups. And the Air Force's definition of an ethnic group is a group of people who have a common set of history and traditions. And sort of like coming out of that fog while marching, I said, whoa, according to its definition, the Air Force itself is an ethnic group. <laughs> and I said, wow. I've not only just joined a new community with different rules and clothing and ways of telling people apart by the slightest differences, like the Amish, who tell each other apart by an eighth of an inch of braid, more or less. We could tell people apart by these tiny little differences and little symbols on their clothing. Not only have I joined this new community, I'm now part of a whole new ethnic group. Thank you. <laughs> Quite the learning experience, Mike. <laughs> Broadening our horizons. We continue with Audrey Mason. Uh, she's been performing, a uh, performing storyteller since 2010. She is a frequent contributor to the story swaps at Moose the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts, and has performed one, one woman shows, including Finding Joy in the Full Catastrophe of Life, When Worlds Collide, and A Powerful Woman. Whether telling about a major life event, such as death in the family, or a simple moment of joy, like running for a bus, Audrey's aim is to help her audiences embrace life's moments and, perhaps, revisit their own experiences from a new perspective. The title of her story is Highland Light. Come on up, Audrey. Oops. Wake up, Audrey. Come on. Everybody else is already up. I'm lying in my cot. Still staring at the canvas ceiling. And it's so beautiful. It rained last night, and I can see that the ceiling is kind of bulging down because the rain is pulled into a lovely little puddle. And I don't know how many of you are campers, but if you ever were to touch that bubble, you would suddenly get drenched with rain. And I was experienced enough camper to know not to touch, but to enjoy that kind of crystalline light that flickers through the canvas. Come on, Audrey, wake up. Breakfast is ready. I hear the hiss of the, the Coleman stove I know my mother is cooking on. I can smell that smell. Again, some of you may have smelled it of fuel, Coleman fuel, such a distinctive smell. And my mom is making toast, and I know that toast is going to have a little bit of that taste to it, a little bit of that fuel taste in there. 
And there's something wonderful about that when you're camping. But I don't want to get up yet. I want to enjoy this moment. Come on, kid. It's your birthday. We're going to Highland Light. <gasps> it's my birthday. I'm nine years old. That's right. I do want to get up. And I jumped up and I got out and we were going to go to Highland Light. Highland Light is on Cape Cod. It's on the tail, very, very tip of Cape Cod. And I don't know, again, you guys, are, a lot of you are local, so you may have been there. Um, and Highland Light, at the time, was this lighthouse that had been, I think it was from like the 1830s. Um, and over time, erosion had eaten away the cliff. And so by the time I was a little girl, there was only about 100 feet away from the cliff and the lighthouse. So you have a lighthouse, and then you have this sudden drop, massive drop, and then just beautiful ocean. That's where we would love to go flying kites. And because it was my birthday, I got to pick a new and get a new kite. And I knew exactly the kite I was going to get. I was going to get the black bat-winged kite. <laughs> Not the, cool, not the silly triangle kites that my siblings had. Oh no, I was going to get one of those new plastic jobbies and they even had sticker eyes that you could put on them. That was going to be my kite. So we went and we went to Highland Light and I got my kite and I got it going, but I was inexperienced at kite flying and this was a new type of kite for me, so I, I couldn't quite get it going. So my older brother, Mark, said, hey, kid, I can help you. And he got it going, and he got it going. And the kite was going higher and higher up. And then he handed it to me, and he said, hang on to it. Watch it fly. And I did. It was so beautiful. And I was watching it fly, and I was just so enamored of my beautiful black bat wing kite flying that I let go. My beautiful black wing, bat wing kite is flying away. And it somehow manages to hook itself up into my sister's kite, which was one of those goofy little triangle kites. And the two of them just start flying away. And you don't have much time to react with 100, about 100 feet in this cliff. You're not going too far. So both kites just took off. And as they hit, they went out there, the little triangle kite, just kind of landed in the ocean, and it started being almost like a little boat. And my beautiful black bat wing kite was just pulling it along, leading it along. And I was heartbroken. My kite, my kite, I wanted my gorgeous kite. There it is, and it's so lovely, but it's going away. And my brother said to me, oh, my Audrey, look, watch it, how beautiful it looks. Oh, Audrey. Your, your kite is going on a big adventure. It's going to go all the way to Europe. <laughs> so the whole family stood there at this cliff with a lighthouse behind us and watched my beautiful black bat wing kite fly away. That was a long time ago. Things have changed. People have passed on. First, my father then my mother, and most recently, my brother Mark. Each of them tied themselves to that black bat wing kite known as death and have floated away. I know one day I'll join them, but for now, I stand here at the cliff of Highland Light and watch. Thanks, Audrey. Our last storyteller tonight is Tina Charpentier. Charpentier. There we go. Who currently resides in Dover. I mean, she has lived in the Seacoast area for most of her life. Tina joined the New Hampshire Air National Guard Communications Unit at Pease in 1982 and spent a total of 21 years with them. Her story tonight is about a letter she received while deployed to Saudi Arabia in 1992 that led to <coughs> unexpected connections. Its title is Mail Call. Come on up, Tina.
So the request to write this letter was nagging at me for some reason. I was thinking, why would I write to this guy? I don't know him. My deal was, if you wrote to me first, I'd be sure to write back. But in my heart, I was thinking, maybe he needs a letter. Uh, but that's not my problem, right? I had work to do and other letters to write. See, I was in Saudi Arabia in 1992, in Riyadh, in fact, with the Air Force. And before I went over, I asked everybody, I pleaded, please write to me, because letters were the method of communication back then. And it could take as much as three weeks to get a letter through over there. And hearing your name called at mail call was awesome. It was just awesome. I mean, it could be a letter from someone, a loved one, or news, or a photo, or a joke from a friend. It really didn't matter. It was something, right? And it was a connection to home, and somebody thought of you. On a side note, too, that mail was censored by the Saudis. I got a, a mad magazine one time, and any exposed skin besides the face of the, the woman was blacked out with a magic marker, black magic marker. <laughs> And that was a comic book. <laughs> also, the mail would get backed up. I mean, my mother wrote something every day. And my friends wrote often. I got a lot of mail. But I could still go days and days and days without my name called at mail call. But then one day, I might get 10, right? So I kind of rationed them to myself. <laughs> I'd open them in order of significance, one a day. You know, like my friend that would send a joke. I mean, it was great. But I might save hers till later. But it was one of her letters that had the name and address of this guy, Jim. It was a friend of hers, and she suggested I write to him. But he had retired from the military and then got a civilian job working again for the military, but as a contractor somewhere in Saudi Arabia. She didn't know where exactly. She only had his APO address, which is like a, a number designation so that a military unit can move around. The mail would follow them. It didn't have a street or a town or anything like that. So anyways, I had plenty of people to write to. So I didn't write to Jim, at first, anyway. And I put her letter on the bottom of my pile. But then it started to bug me for some reason, this insignificant request. It became a nuisance, even. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not in the habit of writing to strange men, or rather, rather men who are strangers to me. <laughs> but then again, he could be both. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and I actually did write at least a letter every day because people did write to me first. But then this nuisance thing. I thought, geez, just write to this guy, right? Get it off my back. <laughs> and you know, it wasn't going to cost me anything. Postage during wartime was free. So uh, reluctantly, I finally gave in and said, just write to the guy. So I wrote him a quick note. I said, you know, we have this friend in common, I'm at Riyadh Air Base, and you know, if you're in the area, give me a call, and I left him my work number. And immediately I felt relieved. <laughs> I stopped thinking about it, and I kicked myself, I should have done it sooner. But guess what? He calls. <laughs> he says, hey, this is Jim, and you're not going to believe this, I work right across the flight line from you. <laughs> what are you doing for Thanksgiving? My wife and I would love the company. Well, great. <laughs> <laughs> so I was real hesitant to answer. And besides not knowing him, Thanksgiving. Now, that one was always a stressful one for me. I mean, I've always felt bad for my mom. She'd work really hard to put this great meal together, and I'd go over early, try to help her set it all up, and then they'd show up, right? My siblings. They'd <laughs> whirl in, you know, and eat everything and make this big mess, and then suddenly they're gone, and... I'd stay and help clean up the mess and everything, and I just felt bad for my mom. I mean, it was really a lot of work more than the holiday. But that year, you know, we really were thankful for each other, being over there in such a different place. So I thought it'd be nice if we had a Thanksgiving meal here. So I got some fried chicken and french fries from the Oasis dining facility, <laughs> you know, the chow hall. And, uh, it's really just a Quonset building with a dirt floor. But, they, you know, so we took that food over to my buddy's flat, Doug and Chauncey, my buddies. And about 25 of us communications folks got together and had this awesome meal together. And we actually had it pretty good there, to be honest with you, because there were some people that didn't have fried chicken even. I mean, they were in some remote places. And so we, a bunch of us got together, and we put together some little packages of this 
hard candy. We had buckets of hard candy. Somebody had shipped us. Some. So we put some packages together, those with some cookies from the dining hall, and sent them off to these guys that had it way worse than us. It was kind of our way to share some of our bounty, as it were. We also had a long distance call home day with MCI. I don't know if you remember them. They gave us a five minute call home, which was a really big deal for Thanksgiving, right? So when Jim asked if I had plans, I did, which was very unusual there. But then he says, well, we could have it the next day. <laughs> Great. And then he says, but you could bring friends, ask your buddies. I'm like, well, I'd have to, right? Because I couldn't drive there. It's one of the big restrictions on women. But then if I had my friends go, it could kind of be cool. I'd be safer anyways. So I did. I asked my buddies, Doug and Chauncey, and Chauncey wanted nothing to do with it. But Doug, he loved food. <laughs> right? I mean, he ate anything, that guy. I mean, one time they had okra at the Oasis dining facility. And <laughs> I'm telling you, Doug was from Pennsylvania. I mean, like me, I'm from Maine. What do we know about okra? <laughs> nothing. And the Sri Lanka guys that were the cooks for us, they knew even less about all of our food. They had trouble with everything. I mean, they even labeled our food in case we didn't recognize it, you know, like noodles, cake, meat. <laughs> you learned real fast not to ask. You just kind of eat. But okra, I mean, you, to, even to look at it, you wouldn't have taken it. It, it. it was these slimy things that looked like milkweed pods. And, and I mean, Doug got it. And so when he took a forkful, I mean, there was this slimy string still stuck to his tray. He put it in his mouth. I think we all made that face like, oh, and he did too, and he spit it out. It's like, Doug, you can't just eat everything. <laughs> but Jim and Donna were civilians, right? We didn't know them, but they could go to a grocery store, maybe buy some reasonably close food, and cook it at home. He's like, oh, home-cooked food, he was in. He was in. So I did get the directions to their flat. And I got in the back seat of our vehicle. Doug had to drive. I always had to sit in the back. And I wore my required buy and scarf that women have to wear. And I always navigated. Since I get to drive all the time, I get to tell them where to go. <laughs> Fortunately, though, I'm a pretty good map reader. But I got to tell you, over there, it kind of tested my ability a little bit, or a lot. I mean, everything is very different. There's no Elm Street or Main Street. And there's like, some like 15,000 royal members of the House of Saud, and they all seem to want to have a street named after them. <laughs> so I'd have to say like, okay, turn right on Al Amir Muhammad bin Abdul Raham Road, <laughs> then take a left on Amim Saeed bin Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad Road. <laughs> and they'd be like, you're making that up. <laughs> But sometimes, too, by the time I'd say those names, we'd miss the turn. <laughs> so finally, I mean, after a while, we just got better with landmarks. And you'd just say, you know, turn at the Aramco Refinery or the King Kalad Mosque or take a left at the Prince Sultan University, right? So when Doug and I actually got to Jim and Donna's compound, they had this really nice flat. It was like a home inside. And they had the most amazing meal food we recognized <laughs> <laughs> on real plates, too, not those metal compartment cold trays, you know. And, and then it turns out that Donna went to Portsmouth High School with my sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we'd even met a few years earlier when we got talking. We'd been to a softball game together with the <laughs> National Guard. <laughs> and Jim, he was previously married before Donna to a friend of mine from Dover. <laughs> Wow, what nice people. No kidding. So here we are hanging out, laughing, sharing stories of home and unexpected connections, yet we're more than 6,000 miles away. Boy, am I glad I finally wrote to him. Mm. Right? And all because of an insignificant joke-sharing letter. By the way, we've never met again stateside, but we always wrote in the mail a Christmas card. Yes. So you never know where your connections might come from. Maybe even the bottom of your to-do list. <laughs> but go to mail call. <laughs>
And let's clap once more for our wonderful storytellers. to our studio audience that makes it so much better, right? Yeah, we love having you here. Thank you. Um, our next True Tales live show will be Tuesday, October 30th. We're so glad. Last year, it was October 31st in Portsmouth. Yeah. You know, Halloween fair. Oh, it's intense. If you think the parking is bad. Mm. Um, so October 30th, it will be perfectly reasonable to come here. So our theme is, it could have been worse. We all have a story on that, I'll bet you. And I, I believe we still have a slot or two open for that. So if you're interested in being a teller, two, two open, uh, let us know. We also have November slots open. So you can email us at truetaleslive, the number one, at gmail.com to join in. We have also released our dates and themes for 2019. We're going to keep going, right? <laughs> We're having fun. Yeah. So check that out and be in touch if you want to share a story of your own. Now, Coming up even sooner than our next show here, our annual True Tales Live onstage performance is coming to the West End Studio Theater, 959 Islington, Islington Street in Portsmouth. We've done this, I think, four years in a row. Uh, it's Sunday, September 30th. That's this Sunday. Yeah. 2 to 4 p.m. Our lineup includes, um, it draws from the previous year's tellers. We just pick a few of our favorites because we can't fit all of you in again. <laughs> um, and this year we are going to feature Suzanne Lang, Martha Reed Johnson, Kate Braun, Tom Osberg, Tina Charpentier, The Different Story, and Andy Davis. The show generally does sell out, so we encourage you to buy your ticket ahead of time. You call 603-300-2986 or go online. It's act1nh.org, and you can buy them that way, too. And we hope to see some of you there. If you are interested in telling a story, but you would like some help with your piece, we have workshops here mo most months, same months that we have shows, we have workshops. So our next one is October 2, 7.30 to 9 p.m., again here at 280 Marcy Street, <coughs> Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They're free and open to the public, and we always have a lot of fun and learn a lot. It's a really lovely way to practice and learn and be together. You can watch our show on Comcast Channel 98, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. and Saturdays at 1 p.m. and anytime as video on demand at youtube.com. You have to search for PPM TV True Tales Live. I promise we'll make it easier soon. <laughs> Let's thank some of those who make this show possible. John Lovering, Pat Spaulding, Steve Koval, David Frainer, Bill Humphreys, and Chad Cordner. Yeah. I'm Amy Antonucci, and until our next True Tales Live show, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening and watching and being here. And stay tuned. Up next, David Frainer will talk with Audrey Mason. My name is David Frainer, and I'm here with Audrey Mason for the second part of our show, as they used to say on uh, the car guys, the third half of our show, <laughs> <laughs> to have a conversation about uh, the art and craft of storytelling um, and uh, the philosophy that underlies uh, your approach to storytelling. So um, it says in your bio that you've been a performing storyteller since 2010. And the, so my first question to you, Audrey, is mm -hmm. what exactly made you decide to become, as you describe yourself, a performing storyteller? Was there some particular event, or was it sudden or gradual? Or Well, it's a, it's a funny thing, because I had several years before 
um, my husband and I had gone. We just wandered into a library. They were having some sort of open house or whatever. And there was a storyteller performing, and his, his name was Learnin' Vernon. And um, he was a lot of fun, and he was very high energy and, and you know, just really got the crowd going and stuff. And, um, we, we, and he kept mentioning Moose and, and, um, and you know, this main organization of storytelling enthusiasts. And, and um, I just thought it was really a lot of fun. And I said to my husband afterwards, you know, I, I think I would like storytelling. I'd like to do that. And he said, I think you'd be good at it. And that, that kind of filed away for like about five years. And then I've been doing, I've been in a meditation group and I, I had been meeting with them regularly. And I said to them one time, I, I, I just felt like, I don't know what I'm, I need to do. I need to, this has been fantastic, but I need to make space for something. I don't know what it is, but I need to make space for something. Mm. And um, so I said, you know, thank you very much. Um, but that's, I'm just going to go do that. And even as I was driving home from that event, I thought of learning Vernon and of storytelling. And I thought, that's it. I want to do storytelling. Uh, and uh, I really lucked out because I went and Googled since Moose was mentioned. I was able to find it. And there was uh, something right on the web page saying, see us at Sharing the Fire, which is a, a, a New England group of storytellers get together. Um, once a year, and I joined, <laughs> I joined Lanes, which is now called Nest, um, and went to a storytelling convention before I ever told a story. Wow. Yeah, so it was like uh, I just kind of dove in the whole hog. It just sort of fell into place. Yep. It was yep. the right time for you to right begin. Right time for me to do it, yes, yes. <clears throat> so, what was your first story? How do you go about deciding on stories? <laughs> The, the first story was called My Cousin Philippe, and, um, and it was about, uh, my, my, I have a lot of family stories, um, and this was about a cousin I never met, um, but that, in fact, um, when I first heard about him, the, my great aunt who was talking about him said, oh, you, you remember Cousin Philippe, and she said, I'll get a picture of Cousin Philippe, and she opened up a photo album and showed me a picture of a dead man in his coffin and that was my first impression of Cousin Oh my Philippe. goodness, Audrey. <laughs> so, but then I found out what a wonderful, fascinating person he was and he was so full of life and everything. So, so the rest of the story is about first this, this is my first impression of this person, but then what I learned in, about who he really was and he was really, really lived a, a strong life. So. Um, that was the song, and it, I, I still can't believe I did this. I even actually sang a naughty French song that, I, that Cousin Philippe used to sing, yes. <laughs> I did all that on stage, very first time, yep. So you must not be too nervous about speaking in public. <laughs> well, you know, I used to, years ago, I used to have to do presentations um, from my job, oh. and I would be terrified to do them. And in fact, I remember one time I had to do one in front of a board, and... I, I was like, I can't stand up. I'm going to pass out if I stand up. So my boss, who was very experienced and very kind, said, I'm going to sit. Because I said, I, I just I have to sit. It's the only way I'm going to do this. And she said, I'm going to sit. I'm going to present before you. I'm going to sit so that they will be used to seeing somebody else sitting so you won't look so weird. And, <laughs> and it was just such a kind thing to have done. And somehow that really helped me. And one of the things I learned was that I don't like presenting. I don't like, like, here I am, I have all the facts. I like sharing. I like a conversation. And I think that's what I love about storytelling is that fourth wall. You're always, you're always brushing it aside and, in, and, and talking to the audience directly and interacting. And um, when you're at your best as a storyteller, you're actually slightly adjusting your story based on the what read of the crowd, you know, so you actually slight, just slightly adjust it, um, or in some cases say maybe uh, that particular story is not for this, for this crowd, but you know, that moment, that interchange between teller and, and audience is, is just a very powerful thing, and that's what I love best about storytelling. I know exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. about, because I think one of the uh, reactions that I have or thoughts that I have is that when we're here doing True Tales live, mm -hmm. the audience is always with you. It's yes. always with yes. us. You know, it's, it's not like Miss Brista in 10th grade uh, speech <laughs> class saying, 
Well, David, that was a C minus. You know? <laughs> it's not that at all. And uh, I, I mean, I think it's still seasoned storytellers can get nervous yes. and can get anxious mm -hmm. because we want it to go well and yeah. want it to be beautiful. You've got to be a little nervous. Yeah, you have you, to be. Yeah, yeah. But that said, the audience is with you. Yes. And I think that sounds like you've experienced that. Yeah, right it's, away. A, it's a wonderful feeling to, to get. Yeah. I, I think that one of the things that I've learned to do. Um, to get comfortable is to come on strong. Start with a really strong, if you, if you start strong and you end strong, even if you goof up some things in, in the middle, it Amen. doesn't matter. Nobody remembers the little dumb things in the middle. <clears throat> but, if, but if you trip at the end or if you trip at the beginning, that's where they're most alert. So yeah, that's, that's what I definitely have learned as well. I'm smiling and looking mm -hmm. at Pat because Pat and Amy Antonucci and I run mm -hmm. a workshop. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we go over and over again is <laughs> nail the beginning, yep. nail the ending, yep. and you can mess around in the middle a little bit. Right, Pat? That's right, David. And, <laughs> and nobody knows those are facts, so make them up if, if you forget. <laughs> right. It's storytelling, it's story so there's telling. room yeah. for... Yes. Now, you say most of your stories are family-related, is that right? Yeah, I, I've done a lot of family-related stories. Um, I do occasionally perform stories um, that are, are not original to me. Um, I recently been on a kick. I, I love Sarah Orne Jewett. I, I, she's, she's a local writer, and I... Um, I think she's a treasure that we somehow have, have lost track of. Um, she tells sweet little stories. Um, and one of the things I've been doing lately is taking her written stories and finding a way to perform them. So I, I, I turn them into Audrey stories. It's not, I'm not, you know, I might use a line or two from her, but I take that content and I'm still trying to keep that spirit that she has. So. Um, so I do that and um, I, I actually have tell uh, the told story, story how much land does a man need? So there's, there's a couple ones that I do outside, but most of them are my family stories, yeah. And my family's story tells. I'm, I'm from a family of, of sit around the kitchen. I was wondering about yeah, that. Yeah, it, either you're playing the spoons and singing and, and dancing with your feet or, uh, or you're telling stories or some combination of the two. <laughs> <laughs> when you, how do you go about putting a story together. When you're working on developing a story, do you write out a text? Do you just wing it? Uh, do you practice in front of a mirror or all of the above or none of the above? Or do you do it different? Is it different depending on the nature of the story you're working up? You know, I usually have a story that's like floating around in my head for quite a while and I will have key phrases that I, I'll just kind of say to myself as I'm driving. Um, but when I do go to settle down and be ready, um, I think a couple of people notice I, I, I use PowerPoint. <laughs> and I, I have little titles that nobody ever sees the title of, e of each slide. And then I have key things that I want to remember to say. So again, you know, my beginning and my ending pieces, I have very specific things I want to say. And then there's just hints to myself um, in a lot of it as well. Um, so, but. I'm definitely, I have seen storytellers that can p perform and do exactly the same wording um, and present exactly the same way. I mean, I, I know storytellers who can actually, uh, for example, a woman who performs Edgar Allan Poe's stories, she has to get the words exactly right, you know? That's a real Otherwise skill. it's not Poe. Right. right, otherwise it's not Poe, right. Um, so, but for me, I, I'm doing the give and take, and I'm also forgiving myself because sometimes I will slightly, I'll the story will get altered because I, I missed a step, and then I realize it, and, and then I just try to weave it back in at a later point so that people get the message, you know, um, because I, you know, I may have introduced, I forgot to introduce a character, for example, I'll I'll find a way to try to sneak them in later if I can, um, as gracefully as possible. So, <laughs> but yeah, I would say, because my style is very conversational storytelling. Um, and so I don't want to uh, over perform and, uh, you know, be over rehearsed kind of feeling. Um, Understood. I don't, there's nothing, there's no such thing as being over rehearsed. I just don't want to look over rehearsed. I should, I should say, you know, I, I want to make sure that I still have that, that, moment, that sense of being in the moment. Yeah, I, I, I sort of relate to that by way of poetry, which is another interest of mine. Mm. There are some excellent poets mm. who can't read their own stuff. Yes, 
Yes, yes. And I think the same might be true to to some degree with storytelling. That you mm. can sort of, I don't know, overdevelop a story as the word exactly, yeah. or something like that. I think sometimes the individual mm. words become too precious. It's, yeah, it's not literature. I mean, it, it's it's a sister to literature, and it ho at, at its best, it's doing the same thing as literature. But, but that preciousness of individual words and individual sentences is, is just not the same. Yep. And you also have to be much more direct. Um, like t in tonight's story, the, the, the beautiful black bat wing kite. Um, Say that, but Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that would be a good example of practicing. <laughs> you want to make sure you get that down. But I used to tell that story and not say at the end that it's death. That they that the kite that they're wrapping themselves around, and most people got it, but why why leave your, your, your right. you know you want right. to help your audience and, and and they don't have the luxury of going back and rereading it and saying wait a second wait now what is it, what are they attaching themselves to the kite where are they going <laughs> you know you can do that in, in a written tale but you can't in uh, in storytelling so you you kind of have to give them more hints. Um, be a little bit more direct than you would in, in, in written form. My background is in the Unitarian Universalist ministry, and ah, one of the things they teach you yeah. in theological school is that old saying about, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. Mm -hmm. And you do, sometimes the, the close has to pull it all together. Yep. <clears throat> People are often, I find, sort of thinking ahead, like, mm -hmm. where does, what's the implication of this part of the story? Where is she going to go with that? Mm -hmm. What does he have in mind? So they're coming to their own conclusions, but it still helps yeah. to nail the close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. couldn't yeah. agree more. And you want to give them more hint, something to anticipate too. Yeah. Now you've heard Amy Antonucci say, mm -hmm. as she says every evening, that our, part of what we're when we do storytelling, mm -hmm. True Tales Live, is to encourage us building a sense of community, mm -hmm. and that's part of our underlying philosophy. Do you have a particular philosophy of storytelling, or something that informs yeah. your approach in a sort of an overarching way? Well, years ago, um, I read, uh, I, 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 I've read a lot of literature, and I read one review of, 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 of something, and it was talking about going from the specific to the general, and that if you can really, if you can start with a very, very real, specific moment, then you can become universal with it. Um, some writers start with a universal and work their way out. I start with a specific, and but my stories at best, at, at, at the least, they're amusing light stories about what happened in Audrey's life. Um, but at the best, they are actually, you were able to recognize something yourselves in them, uh, of yourself or of others around you. And yeah, so that would be, that would be my philosophy. We have about a minute or so left. Um, if you had three or four tips you could mm -hmm. give, mm -hmm. maybe especially newbies, but mm -hmm. we can also all use coaching, mm -hmm. what would you say would be an important thing for people to be mindful of? Well, I already spoke about, you know, punching that, the, the beginning and the Amen. end and, and not yeah. in, you know, everything else, just become uh, something that Michael Perrant said to me uh, one time is because I used to pace a lot. Um, and he said to me, Audrey, we love your energy, but we're, we're worried for you. You're, you're pacing so much, we think you're going to fall off, or you just look yeah, really no edgy. You know, you, you don't want your audience worried about you. You want your audience with you, not worried about you. And, um, and so that really helped me to think about that. And one of the things, I didn't, I didn't have to do it tonight, but sometimes if I'm really feeling edgy, I'll wrap my foot around a stool. So like we had a stool here. Um, if I think I'm going to pace, I'll just wrap my foot around a stool to, to stop myself from that pacing. So that's something that's specific to me, but I'm sure other storytellers might have it too. Well, this brings us to the end of our conversation with Audrey Mason. Thank you so much for being here for Thank your you. story and for our conversation. <clears throat> and it brings us to the end of our broadcast. Our thanks to the entire PPM TV crew for making this possible. Thanks also to each of our tellers, and thanks to you, our audience, live broadcast and online. I do believe, we all believe, that storytelling helps to build community, but it takes a village of listeners to enable stories to come to life, and so we are very thankful for your presence here. 
Our next show is Tuesday, October 30th. Our theme is It Could Have Been Worse. <laughs> if you're considering telling a story in October or any time, we encourage you to come to one of our storytelling workshops. Our next one is Tuesday, October 2nd from 7.20 p.m. So we can start at 7.30 to 9 p.m. All our workshops are free and open to the public. To sign up to tell a story, True Tales Live, the number one, at gmail.com. My name is David Frainer for our entire True Tales live cast and crew. Thank you so much, and good night. Thank you. True Tales Live on PPM-TV is made possible through the generous support of Artists Collaborative Theatre of New England, Act One, presenting outstanding performances of Stories with Heart at the West End Studio Theatre in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. For further information, contact 603-300-2986 or on the web at act1nh.org. With additional support from Pat Spaulding, who really wants to know, hey, what's your story?